It's a huge honor and privilege to be with you and to be part of the ADAO family. And also to acknowledge the enormous effort that's both intellectual, emotional, and actually physical that goes into organizing such an event. So thank you to one and every, every one of you for, the, for this. Another thing I want to say to you before I start the presentation, I sound a bit like a comedian if I say a funny thing happened to me on the way through US Immigration and Customs. I showed my passport to a young man, as I, I thought I had cleared most things, but you know how it is. And um, he said, why are you coming to the US? I'm going to give a presentation on asbestos-related diseases, I said. What's asbestos, he said. OK, where do we start? Um, so I tried to refer him to the ADAO website, but he really wasn't listening. He was about 30. 100 yards further on, I was interrogated again. What, it, what have you come to the US for? Going to give a presentation, what on? Asbestos-related disease. This man was about 60, and he said, oh my god. This place is full of it. I'm going to sue the pants off the government. I had thought of replying to the first one by saying, well, actually, it's a killer. It's a lethal substance. People are going to die. And this building is probably full of it. But luckily, caution prevailed. I wanted to come to the conference. Right, moving on. Linda asked me to make the case for palliative care in mesothelioma. And the outline of my presentation is here. I'm going to talk a bit about what is palliation, palliative care, and hospice care a bit about the research I've done, a bit about the support group, and what the implications are. So, no mean task. Like you in the UK, we share this sort of graph showing the uh, um, projected rise in instance of mesothelioma. I'm talking about plural mesothelioma in this situation. Um, and actually, this graph is already out of date because we're over 2,000 deaths a year already. And work from Sweden shows that the graph isn't falling. That purple line on the right, it is not falling in the way that has been projected. And we know that there's a great under-diagnosis of mesothelioma, under-reporting. So the figures that um, policymakers are working on are, are actually well out of date and inaccurate. So what is palliative care? Palliative care, it's very wordy this, but it is the active holistic care of patients with advanced progressive illness. Management of pain, other symptoms, and provision of psychological, social, and spiritual support is paramount. The goal of palliative care is achievement of the best, and it should say best possible, quality of life for patients and their families. Many aspects of palliative care are also applicable earlier in the course of the illness in conjunction with other treatments. And the aims are to affirm life and regard dying as a normal process, not a medicalized event, provide relief from pain and other distressing symptoms, to integrate the psychological and spiritual aspects of patient care, to offer a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death, and to offer a support system to help the family cope during the patient's illness and in bereavement. In the history of palliative care, acknowledging the great late Dame Cicely Saunders, she'd worked as a medical social worker in hospital and then as a doctor, and she was so distressed by the conditions suffered by patients with cancer, and in particular, the way in which they died and the medical neglect. As a result, she set up the first modern hospice, St. Christopher's, in 1967. And at that time, hospices were places where people purely went to die. Things have changed. She started very important research into the management of pain and other symptoms. And as such, she's the internationally acclaimed, she was internationally acclaimed founder of the modern hospice movement. This is where I work, and like a lot of the charitable hospices in England, it started off as a private house, not purpose-built, but then with, on the right hand, on the left hand as you look at it, um, a purpose-built addition. Just a few words about UK hospices in this century. There's about 220 hospices altogether, but the great majority are independent, voluntary, charitable institutions. And it's a bit different from the, the situation here in that the NHS provides just 30% of the funding. The rest has to be fundraised. It's an enormous effort. All the services are free of charge. So these are not um, commercial profit-making organizations. They're voluntary and charitable. They provide about 80% of palliative care beds in the UK, although look at the discrepancy with the funding we get. Now this is what I want you to remember, 50% of inpatients go home. They come in for control of symptoms, for respite, for themselves or for their carers, so that the care can continue at home. 
and just one in 25 cancer patients dies in a hospice, so normally it's about 4%. We also run from hospices, and these are all part of palliative services, hospice at home services with specialised nurses who add to what our normal community district nursing services can provide. And this aims to keep people in the place of their choice. We run medical clinics, complementary and creative therapies which are so valuable, and family support and bereavement services. And all the way along, we work alongside the NHS. Just a few words about recent progress in palliative care, which actually impacts on the care of patients with mesothelioma. In the year 2000, NICE, which is the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, brought out national guidance on supportive and palliative care, and this emphasised how important it is to have a multidisciplinary approach. Last year, there was a national end-of-life care strategy. And amongst many other things, really the aim of this was to extend palliative care to non-cancer patients and to promote patient choice. That raises some issues for us, because now our patients in the hospital are asked, where do you want your care to be when things get towards the end? And a lot of these patients are saying, well, actually, I'd quite like hospice, and we haven't got the resource. And most of them are saying, we'd like home, or hospice is a second choice. And home services are in need of great development, and there is expansion going on, but again, mainly by the charitable sector, although the government has accepted that care at the end of life is a statutory responsibility. But so far, we still need an enormous amount of funding. Now, this year, something quite marvellous has happened, and that's the Daily Mirror campaign. The Daily Mirror is one of the popular tabloids in our country, and it's not normally, perhaps, the sort of paper that you would expect to do this, but they have got a, um, an inspired young journalist called Nick Summerland, who has started a petition to try and get behind progress for people suffering from asbestos-related disease. And there is a petition being circulated in the UK at the moment on the website and, and um, on paper, asking the government, calling on the government to step up to the mark and fund a national centre for asbestos-related disease research, as they have done in Australia. But as Laurie was saying there, there's a big worry about funding. They're asking for compensation to be reinstated for plural plaques and for the health and safety um, executive, which I think is like your EPA, I think it must be, um, to have the resources that they need for monitoring their own recognised standards about asbestos removal. And they're also calling for a national register of all asbestos surveys of public buildings. You can obtain that information if you try, but it would be so much easier and so much more sensible to have a national register. So things are happening that will impact. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the study I did, um, which is based on the experience of mesothelioma for patients and families in northern England. And this was a doctoral study, community-based, four-part, mixed methods case study. The mixed methods mean some of it was number crunching and some of it was interview, much more soft data, qualitative, listening and analysing patients' experiences. This was conducted in three locations, all with a history of major industrial use of asbestos. barrow in furness which is near where I come from in South Cumbria, which had one of the country's largest shipyards and also an, an allied heavy engineering industry. Leeds, where there was a notorious textile fa factory right in the middle of a built-up area and next door to a school. And Doncaster, another ur urban area where there was a large um, railway plant and manufacture and maintenance uh, uh, organ uh, institution. The, the study consisted of interviews with 15 patients all suffering from mesothelioma, some of them right near the end of their lives, others earlier on in their illness. Six focus groups with bereaved relatives where I said, tell me how it is for you. And that should have come with a health warning. Interviews with 11 healthcare professionals and a comprehensive review of the complete medical records of 80 patients who died with pleural mesothelioma. And that meant examining their family doctor records, their hospital records, and if they'd been anywhere near a hospice, the hospice records too. And I'm going to now pick out some of the main features from that study. And I apologize if this is distressing to anyone in the audience, but I really feel we have a duty of care and a, and a duty to tell the truth about this illness because we have to tell people exactly what our patients and their families are going through. 
So these were the recorded symptoms in mesothelioma. And in red, the main ones, and you'll see that almost everybody gets short of breath and almost everybody suffers from pain. If you look at the um, items in green, these indicate some of the psychological and emotional disturbances that go with this disease. And bear in mind, this was taken from medical records. And I don't know what it's like in the States, but in England, certainly, doctors are not terribly good at writing down psychological or emotional problems of patients being much more um, focused on the physical. And this is obviously, this is bound to be a gross underestimate of the amount of the distress, the sheer psychological distress of this illness. If we compare pleural mesothelioma with lung cancer in terms of recorded symptoms, we look how many more patients reported dyspnea, which I'm sorry I should have explained, dyspnea means difficulty breathing, not just breathlessness but any sort of difficulty breathing. Pain, again much more common in mesothelioma than in lung cancer, cough less so. And now there have been a couple of studies which have indicated and um, actually quantified the difference. And uh, no, Anna Nowak in Australia showed that breathlessness or dyspnea scores were similar in lung cancer and mesothelioma. And lung cancer normally comes out in the awful league tables, tables of symptom burden and disease burden. Um, lung cancer normally comes out as the worst cancer. But the pain scores were significantly higher in mesothelioma, and social role and functioning scores were also worse in mesothelioma. And then Sebastiano Mercadante in Sicily, where they have a huge problem, did a study looking at the morphine requirements for all different types of cancer. And he found in a small number of mesothelioma cases in that study that mesothelioma was unique in that the morphine requirements continued to escalate with time, whereas with most cancers, there's an equilibrium reached at some stage. It does, there's a, a problem with this study in that he didn't use the full range of opioids of strong painkillers that, that are at our disposal, but again, it showed that there is a problem. Now moving on to what the patients told me. What's it like to be that breathless? Well, it's a threat to life, it's terrifying. People talk about suffocating to death or gasping for air or being as scared I'll get as bad as my father got when father had mesothelioma. And a, a man looking after his 50-year-old wife said, I'm lying on the bathroom floor with her, trying to rescue her, trying to console her when she was desperately gasping for breath. There's also the stigma that loss of health agency and the embarrassment of having a disease which makes you short of breath. And one of my patients absolutely flatly refused to go for a repeat chest x-ray because he didn't want his former workmates to see him gasping for breath as he walked down the hospital corridor. Now this is what palliation is all about. I mentioned multidimensional um, or uh, multidisciplinary approach to breathlessness. So we've um, heard from previous speaker about the benefits that can come from surgery, and I'm all for that, uh, but not for EPP. Again, in agreement with um, Dr. Cameron. But looking at the multidimensional approach to breathlessness, this requires quite some juggling. So there may be decisions about oxygen and air. Benzodiazepines are things like Valium, sedatives, opioids, morphine, and a whole variety of other things that may be newer derivatives that, or newer synthetics that might work better, have fewer side effects than morphine, and add to that the psychological approaches. Now, the non-pharmacological management of dyspnea, again, is something that comes under palliative care. And the whole key here is to improve mastery, to improve the sense, or to give patients a sense that they have some control. To do that, we need to know our patients and what they understand, what they hope or fear or expect about breathlessness. There needs to be an individual management plan. It may well involve complementary and creative therapies. And in fact, our complementary therapy team teach patients breathing control, breathing management techniques. We definitely need to involve the families and carers, and maybe rehabilitation in some cases. And here is my really high-tech bit of equipment, which hasn't survived the um, trip across the pond. This is a handheld fan. And a handheld fan is a useful bit of kit, dead cheap. If you've got breathlessness, get one. It stimulates the nerves on the front of the face, which signals to the brain that actually there's plenty of air out there, everything calms down, breathlessness comes a bit under control. So it doesn't cost a bomb. And some of the charities in, in England, one of the charities in England is actually giving these out now. 
So just to move on to pain, there's a whole variety of structures that can be involved, the pleura, the nerves, ribs or vertebrae, even the spinal cord can be involved. And this means it's frequently a complex pain with neuropathic, that's nerve elements, as well as inflammatory elements. And I have to tell you that morphine is not necessarily the best strong painkiller. We have alternatives that work better if morphine doesn't suit you. Now this is what doctors are taught to follow, the World Health Organization analgesic ladder, in terms of stepping up the painkillers that you use. I won't go into details here, but it starts off with simple things like paracetamol, moves, paracetamol, moves through um, maybe codeine or add a, an anti-inflammatory and up to morphine. But this really is out of date and inadequate for mesothelioma. Back to the pyramid, a multidimensional approach. So yes, we'll use opioids. We'll maybe use anti-cancer therapies. We'll certainly use psychological approaches in trying to encourage mastery and maybe nerve ablation techniques if necessary. What the patients told me about the burden of mesothelioma was this. They had to cope with symptoms, medical interventions were a burden. Finding out about mesothelioma was a nightmare and the things that some doctors said when asked about prognosis beg a belief. The huge psychosocial issues and the benefits and civil compensation claims that are distract distracting when you are trying to deal with a terminal illness. Patients told me about coping, that they were determined to cope, they were stoical, had a stiff upper lip, maybe that's a particularly British thing, I don't know. Um, a lot were angry, but they also would attempt to stay healthy and made practical plans. And a lot talked about putting on a false front to all except the nearest and being in it together. But this coping, coping narrative, when you go underneath it, when you dig underneath it, people are cope, say they're coping in spite of significant symptoms and distress. What we call a restitution narrative, in other words, trying to spin it, trying to put a positive spin on it. And that's important because it restores a sense of control and bolsters self-esteem. But if you tell a busy doctor or a busy nurse that you're coping, that's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear about all the problems because their caseload is probably huge. But actually, saying you're coping when it's really difficult inhibits further inquiry and it may block useful interventions. So these are some of the areas of psychosocial distress, anxiety, attribution, causation, the body image issues, and I've sh been shown so many photos of people who look strong and fit and muscular, and in front of me is somebody who's lost a lot of weight and really hurt by that. The burden on carers, the contamination of family members, and again, the claims and benefit procedures all add a, hu a huge amount to anxiety and distress. The bottom point, medical nihilism, when I did this study, which ran from 2000 to 2007, medical nihilism was evident and distressing. Just briefly looking at the diagram of the disease trajectory, patients often, presu uh, often present with a pleural effusion. So the first point on the graph, actually they improve, their function goes up when that fluid is taken off. But then there are other dips on the inevitably downhill progress. And that's to, not to say I know we have some long-term survivors, but they are the exceptions. Hopefully there'll be more. In that final 12 months, patients have an enormously busy time. Two or three admissions, three or four pleural aspirations, seven investigations as well as chest x-rays, five outpatient appointments, 11 family doctor consultations, four of these at home, and goodness knows how many contacts with specialist and community nurses. We did ask what did the people in Barrow want in the year 2005, and Barrow, one of the study sites where one of our ladies was at the first meeting, we had a, a, a hospice-funded meeting to say, what should we do about mesothelioma in our community? And we asked these two questions. What concerns do you have about mesothelioma, the way in which it's affected you or someone you know? What suggestions can you make um, concerning new or improved services for people affected by mesothelioma? This is what they said. We want easy access to information about the disease treatment and trials. We want treatments locally and easy access to centers of excellence. And those was because they'd had problems in these areas. Expert advice about benefits, compensation, family support and bereavement care, and education for healthcare professionals. And from this, that gave us the mandate to set up our own Barrow Asbestos-related disease support group, who send you greetings. 
So in summary, benefits of the palliative approach, it's patient-centered, it's about quality of life, it promotes patient choice, it can accompany active treatments, and I think there are issues maybe about your health insurance system here where that may not always be possible. It can avoid wasting time chasing some futile interventions, and it supports the patients and their family, and it's more cost-effective. The implications here. Palliative care should be available for all mesothelioma patients. It should be involved early. It should be seen as a positive option, and it should run in parallel with any active interventions. So support groups should campaign for access to specialist palliative care. Patients with mesothelioma and their families deserve all the help we can offer. I'd like to acknowledge help with the research from these people and leave you with two slides of Windermere, as a reminder of where I come from. Thank you.